Today, I'm really excited to have a friend and mentor of mine uh, available to be interviewed about some of his new work and old work, uh, Dr. Mike Gorman. Uh, I'm going to read from his uh, official bio from a book just because I don't want to leave anything out that I'll add a little bit about my uh, my knowledge relationship with Dr. Gorman. Uh, he holds the Raymond uh, E. Brown Chair in Biblical Studies and Theology at St. Mary's Seminary and University in Baltimore, Baltimore, Maryland. So he's on the opposite end of the country as me, where he has taught since 1991. Uh, he has written across um, many subjects in New Testament studies and biblical interpretation. Some of my favorite books are Apostle the Crucified Lord, which I've used as a textbook many times. Elements of Biblical Exegesis, I may have used that as a textbook more than anybody else, else I know. <laughs> Recommend it all the time. Uh, little books like Reading Paul, uh, which is uh, great for churches and pastors to use with uh, congregations, great for lay people, great for kind of a refresher. And then the book that we're going to talk about today, which is called Cruciformity, uh, published by Urbans. And we're excited to um, just remind folks, if they don't know, that there's a 20th anniversary edition. I'm actually using this as a textbook with my students currently. And as just as they're digging in now, they're already finding lots of great stuff in here. Um, as a 20th anniversary edition, it's just helpful to know that uh, this is one of the first Pauline theology books that I read as a student uh, in the early 2000s. I think it was pretty fresh uh, off the uh, printing press when I read it, and it just blew me away. And it was one of those books, I say this in my foreword in this, in this edition, it was one of those books where um, until that time I wasn't that interested in Paul. Uh, and, and I didn't, you know, when I thought of Pauline theology, I thought of kind of boring topics like justification theory and ordo salutis kinds of things. And then I read this, and it's talking about stories, it's talking about Paul's life, it's talking about Paul's sufferings, it's talking about love and all kinds of other subjects. And um, I, I feel like that book, as I mentioned in my in my uh, foreword, really turned the lights on for me, for Paul, and helped me make sense of Paul the person, and not just uh, you know a, a hand that uses a, a pen to write. Um, and so uh, I'm excited today to be able to talk uh, face to face uh, in this uh, platform with Dr. Mike Gorman. Uh, welcome to the show, uh, uh, Mike. I'll, I'll just call you Mike because we're friends, but uh, yeah. I'm sure your students call you Doc. But um, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, maybe maybe a little bit more than I said, uh, just from some of the details on the book. Tell us about who you are. Sure. Well, thank you, first of all, Nije, for having me on, and especially for um, writing the foreword to this book, uh, this 20th anniversary edition. I, I didn't feel old until you just said, uh, you know, you've, you're now an established scholar, and you said you read this book early on, and that was 20 years ago. So uh, one of us is getting older, maybe both of us, but yeah. I am a native of the state of Maryland, and I, and I teach in the state of Maryland, which is unusual in our field. You know, most people have to travel, end up in some other place they've never heard of or been to before, but I'm very blessed to be living near where I was born and teaching uh, in the same state, at least where, where I grew up. So I've been at St. Mary's, as you said, since 1991. So I've been here a long time, beginning uh, just over 30 years. And my, my interest in Paul began as a, as a doctoral student, primarily because I was going against the grain of what was going on in gospel studies at the time. I was very interested in literary narrative approaches to the gospels, and everybody was still doing redaction criticism uh, without sort of looking at the literary whole. So I thought, well, I, I might do better in Paul. I was interested in narrative, and Richard Hayes was one of my great influences even early on. And of course, he was strongly interested in narrative. So I got very interested in Paul and, and did a, a PhD dissertation that the, the ideas in which became the basis for this book, Cruciformity, but the dissertation is not simple, or the book is not simply a kind of publication of the dissertation. Um, I went on, as you, as you, as you know, to, um, to, to broaden a little bit and to write in other areas. So uh, I've enjoyed staying with Paul 
but I've also enjoyed writing about John and Revelation and, and other parts of the New Testament. So I'm excited to say my commentary on Romans is coming out in a few months. And uh, thank you in advance. I, I know you blurbed that, so thank you. And um, I think you blurbed that, didn't you? I didn't, but I I invited you to write oh. on the themes of Romans. Oh, which, yeah. Which... Okay. Well, that's blurbing it in a different yeah. way. <laughs> uh, right. Sorry. Um, uh, and then I've just committed to writing another commentary for Erdman. So I'll, I'm actually starting work on that very soon. So great. Well, we look we looked uh, forward to all those great projects. Um, uh, let's just launch in and talk a little bit about cruciformity. Um, I, every time I teach Paul, whether it is uh, introduction to Paul or whether it's a seminar, I'm teaching a seminar right now. Um, I talk to my students about cruciformity as a concept. And what, uh, what I find really gratifying is it's a paradigm for looking at Paul and understanding his thought and his life. Um, and so that helps students because they'll say things like, I've never looked at Paul this way before. Mm. Um, can you talk about this book? Um, you know, I don't know what your expectations were when you first published this book. Um, I, as an author myself, you just never know how a book's going to land. It's about time. It's about, uh, you know, the, the audience and it's about the publisher. But tell us a little bit about this book and kind of what inspired you to write this book and a little bit about what you mean by cruciformity. Yeah. Let me start with the, the definition of the term just briefly, and then I'll talk about sort of the book. Um, the, the term cruciform is really, as an adjective, is an architectural term used to describe the shape of churches and cathedrals in particular. So cross shape is all that cruciform means in the shape of the cross. And in the uh, early part of the early to middle part of the 20th century, some biblical scholars and theologians started using the term as an adjective to describe discipleship in various uh, gospels, especially the gospel of Mark. And eventually that term came in, in a couple of contexts to be used in, in the form of a noun. I didn't know this at the time. I thought I had sort of created the noun cruciformity, namely the, the content of a cross-shaped discipleship or cross-shaped life. Uh, it turns out a couple other people had used the term uh, uh, previously. But for me, then, cruciformity means a cross-shaped form of life or a cross-shaped discipleship, conformity to the crucified Christ, if you will. So now what does that mean? That's, a, that's the more fundamental question. And that's what the book is about, really, is unpacking that. What does it mean to have a, a, a cross-shaped existence or a cross-shaped life, to be a cross-shaped community? A number of ways of getting at that, but very briefly, I'll just say for, for the moment, before talking about the book per se, one way of looking at it is, you know, Protestants and Christians in general often say the cross is the source of our salvation. The argument of this book is that the cross is also the shape of our salvation or the shape of our life in Christ. Not only the source, but the shape of our life in Christ. Um, so, yeah. Okay, so Mike, this this seems obvious to me that this is true. I mean, there's so many texts that we could talk about. We're gonna, you know, hopefully we we'll get a chance to talk about Philippians two. We could talk about Galatians two. We could talk about Second Corinthians. There's so many places. So contextualize your book for us. Um, in a way, this is this is kind of a new idea when you're writing this book. You're pitching this to Erdman's. I'm imagining. And that means it wasn't at the center of the conversation about Pauline theology at the time that you wrote this. To talk a little bit about, you know, what were other kind of theories going on? And, yeah. um, you know, would there be people at the time that would have pushed back against this? What, what would have been the conversations at the time? Yeah. Well, a couple of things were going on that were not in my favor. Um, one was the in the society of biblical literature everyone had been doing very discreet approaches to pauline theology the theology of first and second corinthians the theology of romans and the books that came out of the sbl pauline theology seminar were in that vein there there was some common com commonality among them but all most people were not in the mood if you will the the, the academic mood to sort of look at Paul as a whole. And I really much 
wanted to do that because I had seen in my dissertation research this uh, narrative substructure, not only to Galatians, which Richard had argued for, Richard Hayes, but to the whole of Paul's uh, corpus, at least for the undisputed letters, which is what I had dealt with in the dissertation and dealt with primarily in the book. The other thing that was pushing back against me either explicitly or implicitly was the idea of spirituality. And that was like a, a buzzword. What does that mean? You know, we, we're gonna talk about Paul, you wanna talk about hardcore theology, right? And I was trying to say, Paul's theology is really about a lived experience. It's not simply about a, a, an idea or, or the realm of ideas, but what does it mean to take the death and resurrection of Jesus as the shape and the, and the, the reality of, of, um, of Christian existence, or if you will, early, early Jesus follower existence. The one thing that was in my favor, uh, other than Richard's uh, approach to narrative in Galatians in particular, the other thing that was in my favor was the work of E.P. Sanders, whose book, Paul and Palestinian Judaism, had really emphasized participation in Christ. So what I really did in this book was to pull together the, in a positive way, the ideas that were floating about, about participation and turn that language into participation as spirituality language and to take the narrative approach of Richard Hayes, especially others too, but especially Richard, and to try to pull these, I, I'm looking somewhat in retrospect because I'm not sure I was consciously doing this, but in, in the sort of atmosphere of the day, I was pulling together the participationist eschatology of E.P. Sanders and the narrative ethics and narrative theology of Richard Hayes and trying to come up with a synthesis that would uh, emphasize both of them with a focus on the cross. Yeah, and, and I'm curious, um, you know, as I read again through the through cruciformity, uh, I, I'm noticing more and more how much participation language is is used throughout the book. And and for those who don't know, uh, Mike wrote a book more recently called Participating in Christ, which is kind of the kind of most recent uh, development of his thinking on this subject. Read his whole series. I think it's an unintentional trilogy, as you said. Uh, he has a series of books. Um, or are there four now? I can't remember. Are there three yeah, or four? Well, that there was, a, there was an unintentional trilogy, and now at a different publisher is, is participating in Christ. So That's what right. is that, a, a quadrilateral or something? Yeah, qu quadrology, something like that. Um, so, but w one thing I'm interested in, in terms of, you know, uh, whether this was an issue when this book was published, is, um, so as I'm reading this, I'm, I'm thinking participation, you know, I'm also seeing imitation uh, language in there. Um, and I remember in the back of my head, Ernst Kaseman having problems with that idea, um, especially as it relates to the, the Philippian Christ hymn, yeah. um, that, that uh, I think Kaseman was one of the scholars that was kind of against that, saying, um, he's Lord, we're subject, uh, you know, that kind of, did that play into this at all? Was that, was there pushback on that or, or reservation about how that might be received? A little bit, but it was more of a leftover because in the late 70s, I think it was, or maybe the early 80s, Larry Hurtado wrote a really important, uh, the late Larry Hurtado wrote a really important essay putting together the two views of, of um, that, that language, if you will, at the beginning of Philippians that suggests either the Kazaman Martin view, which is the primary focus of the Christ poem is Christ is the Lord and we live in him, so to speak, uh, almost secondary to Christ's lordship. And then there was the traditional ethical imitation model. And uh, Larry Hurtado has this wonderful essay that actually I figured in my dissertation, I think it, it's in the book somewhere as well, in which he, he talks about Christ as the lordly example, Christ as lordly example in Philippians. And, and that for me sealed the deal and, and, and fix the problem that, that Kesaman and Martin on the one hand and the other readings on the other had, had, had posited. So um, I, I think the book, my, my dissertation and then the book I think had solved that, uh, solved that problem. And I think people were beginning to come on to, it's okay to talk about imitation. I would prefer the language of participation, but it's okay to talk about that and still emphasize the, the, 
you know, cosmic lordship of Jesus. I think it, it might not be in this book, but I think you used the language at some point of non-identical repetition. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. actually borrowed from Nicholas Lash via Steve Fowl. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. And, and, oh. No, it is, it is in cruciformity, at least as I recall, the language is there, but I have used it elsewhere as well. But yeah. Uh, so the idea of non-identical repetition is, of course, we cannot and are not called to imitate Jesus precisely. For one thing, we can't die for the sins of the world, right? Um, right. On the other hand, there is a, an appropriate correspondence, and this is where narrative comes in and the Christ poem comes in. Uh, there is a correspondence between how Christ lived, died, and how um, Christian believers in him, shaped by him and infused with his spirit, can and should also live. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the structure of the book because, um, you know, there's an obvious um, allusion or homage to Paul's triad, faith, hope, and love. And that, that is obviously in the book, and I'll ask, and I'll ask you to explain why you chose those, uh, that framework. But I remember when I was writing the forward and I, and I sent it to you just to get your thoughts, uh, I made some reference to that. And then I remember one of the small notations you made was add power. Power is really important to the discussion. Yeah. Um, so can you explain why you organize the book around faith, hope, and love, which makes sense, but it would just you know be helpful for people that haven't read the book. Mm -hmm. And then how does power f factor into all of that? Yeah. Well, with my narrative... Uh, inclinations, I started rereading Paul and, and looking for narrative throughout the, the, the corpus, the, the, the body of his letters, and began to see that these um, stories that Paul would tell or would allude to often could be connected to either faith or hope or love, and that there was something significant about the way that Paul understood each of those terms as, as telling a story. So for instance, faithfulness had to do with, in the face of temptations to do otherwise, uh, to relinquish rights or relinquish privilege for the benefit of others. But that, that defined faith, faithfulness to God, but it also almost simultaneously defined the meaning of love for others. So there was this kind of narrative quality that began to emerge as I looked at the various um, Pauline letters and the stories that I discerned in them. So it became it, that plus the importance of faith, hope, and love for Paul, not just in 1 Corinthians 13, which people often associate it with, but it's already in his earliest letter in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, and basically the first sentence. We find it in Galatians, we find it in Colossians. So I think it's part of the one of the major contributions of Paul to Christian theology is, is coming up with, if you will, these three terms. So that, that part made sense. But as I was thinking through all of those, I also began to realize, that especially in the, in the end of the 20th century, there was still so much concern about the use of power in the world. Going back to philosophers, critics of Christianity, practitioners of Christianity, what is it? What is power, and what is that all about? That was a, a dominant theme in 20th century humanities, philosophy, and so forth. And I thought, I, I thought, I, I really need to make this fourth. It's not really exactly a virtue, but this fourth entity, if you will, of, of Paul, um, prominent in the book. And so that's how that fourth that fourth dimension came in. And I try to connect it very deliberately to his understanding of especially of love, that these are really closely connected. Um, yeah, that makes sense, because the cross as a Roman object is about power, I mean, right? Uh, and so it would make sense that um, the use of that language in Paul uh, conjures up that same uh, construct of power, right? Yeah, and, cha and challenges it. That, yeah. That's the fundament one of the fundamental claims of, the, of that chapter. Uh, and I think also challenges many understandings of power on offer in the church and in society more widely that may be remnants of Roman imperial power in, in some ways. So uh, 
-hmm. yeah it made it made perfect sense to me after a while to to do that and it's not just physical power it's economic power as well second sure. corinthians 8 9 things like that and so oh yeah power um, is everywhere yeah so, so w w one of the benefits of this book for me uh, you know along those lines is um, not just talking about uh, kind of pie in the sky, you know, theological concepts like uh, heaven or hell or things like that, uh, which are, you know, things that Paul talks about in, in his own way, um, but, but things that we experience every day, uh, uses of power, economics, uh, relationships, things like that. Um, I want to ask you, you know, if this came out in the early 2000s, if I recall, Jimmy Dunn's theology came out before this. Correct, so, 98. Is that right? Okay, so you must have been writing. I'm guessing you were writing or researching. Uh, tell me about how you compare Jimmy. So Jimmy wrote this, for those of you that don't know, Jimmy wrote this really big, uh, I don't know if I, yeah, I have it right here. He wrote this really big book. I actually think of Cruciform as a big book, but this is bigger. <laughs> uh, he wrote this book, uh, The Theology of Paul the Apostle, um, which is pretty comprehensive. Jimmy does... Uh, um, based it on the structure of Romans, right. but he walks through all the categories of sin and salvation and church and eschatology and things. How would you compare and contrast that with what you did? Because you're saying there weren't a ton of people doing comprehensive pawn theologies. So Jimmy kind of stands out in the late nineties for that reason. Yeah, for sure. Uh, there's, there's some overlap and there's also some obvious differences. As you said, Jimmy was taking Romans as the template for Pauline theology, which I think is valuable in some respects, but also limiting in others. Yeah. Um, but, but overall, what he does and the way he categorizes Paul's theology according to Romans is, is beautifully executed and is very comprehensive and structurally uh, interesting. And it's, it's, it's a deliberate attempt to be comprehensive about Pauline theology. And he does, Jimmy being Jimmy, give a lot of um, room for Paul's experience, Paul's mm -hmm. spirituality, if you will, everyday life. And he also does focus quite a bit on participation. He's one of the theologians of Paul who either in spite of the tradition or revisiting the tradition uh, emphasizes that. Clearly, my book is not trying to be quite as comprehensive as right. as as that is i i don't have specific sections say on pauline eschatology or christology but because i think this narrative reading of paul's experience touches on almost every aspect of every letter that by the time you're done reading cruciformity you have been introduced to just about everything paul says and does uh, but it's a it's a very different way of getting of getting at that, for sure. Different structure to the book, different emphasis. But at the end, um, in that way, it's a it is both different from and similar to Jimmy's theology of the Apostle Paul, because it is a non attempt. It's not an attempt to be systematic in terms of traditional theological categories or following one letter, but it does end up at the end of the day um, dealing in a pretty comprehensive way with a lot of the same things that Jimmy deals with from a different perspective. Uh, on the subject of narrative, um, I remember that book, Narrative Dynamics in Paul, I think edited by Bruce Longenecker. Yeah. Uh, which was really helpful for me to understand the academic discussion of this. So maybe there are listeners and viewers who don't uh, know this conversation about and the debate about mm -hmm. narrative and Paul, because like you said, narrative criticism was applied uh, rigorously to the Gospels. That makes sense. Um, I, As I recall, Jimmy was skeptical of narrative approaches to Paul, um, more skeptical than than someone like you or Richard Hayes. I think, as I recall, Jimmy was okay with micro narratives about Abraham, or, but but the idea of a macro narrative seemed uh, uh, hard to swallow. Uh, so correct me if I'm wrong, but um, talk a little about that conversation. And you know, you you'd said earlier uh, in this uh, discussion that 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 was maybe a concern of how that would be received. 
Mm. Um, t talk a little bit about the conversation uh, that developed over how you can demonstrate that Paul had a kind of master narrative and what's your specific approach to that? Yeah. Well, let me preface this by saying that in spite of some of the language and conceptualities that are offered in the book, specifically narrative and specifically spirituality, most people have responded very positive, positively to the book, including Jimmy, uh, including people who have reservations about certain aspects of it. But the unpacking of the cross as the, which it, many people had understood that Paul's theology centered around the cross and resurrection with a strong emphasis on the cross, but very few people had, had seen or unpacked the significance of that for Paul's own spirituality, for what he saw in Christ and what he wanted to offer his communities. So people responded very positively to that, even if they had some reservations, as I said, about a little bit of the language. But I think for me, at least, um, when I wrote my PhD dissertation, which was comparing Paul and Epictetus on the role of the self in Paul's theology and in Ep Epictetus's um, philosophy, if you want to call it that, um, what I found was, what, whereas Epictetus was making pronouncements, little short snippets or, or short paragraphs about uh, certain things about the self, protecting the self, um, going after the best good of the self and so forth. Paul was saying some very different kinds of things, but he was saying them in the form of a story. And specifically, starting with Philippians 2, 6 to 11, the Christ hymn, or the, as I prefer to call it now, the Christ poem. And there you have a, a kind of narrative, abbreviated narrative, if you will, or succinct narrative of Christ's um, eternal presence um, in the form of God, his relinquishing of that status in some way to, um, to empty himself, to humble himself, as one scholar has put it, this kind of succession of, of getting lower and lower, and you know, Joseph Hellerman's idea of a cursus pedorum, a, instead of climbing upward, upwardly mobile, as you would want to do in the Roman Empire and the American world for that matter too, um, that Christ descends first to humanity and then to the position of a slave. So that's a story. Uh, and it's a story that for Paul summarizes the um, incarnate, let's use theological language, the incarnation and the, and the death of Christ in a very succinct but very um, pregnant way. And he alludes to that structure. I, and I actually give it a name, a kind of, although X, not Y, but Z, although status, not selfish exploitation, but self-giving. Uh, Paul uses that structure and alludes to that uh, particular narrative on numerous other occasions, both to describe Christ and to describe himself, as well as to, to point out the nature of Christian faithfulness, Christian love, Christian discipleship. So I started calling that, Paul, and I do it in the book first, this book, first of all, I started calling that Paul's master narrative. Well, as soon as you start talking about master narratives, you're going to get two kind of pushbacks. First of all, master narratives are bad. We live in the postmodern age. So I'll use Richard Bauckham's terminology of a, a non-malevolent or non-controlling or, or you know, that, that kind of um, helpful, positive, non, um, non-modern narrative, one that unleashes freedom in the best sense of the word, non-controlling narrative. And then the other pushback you get is, well, how do you know that that's the master narrative if there is a master narrative? So I've had to argue that you, you find, for instance, Israel in that story, even though Israel is not explicitly named, you find resurrection and exaltation, at least exaltation in the story. Uh, so, so, so I think you do find sort of creation to new creation in that narrative, but it's been a little bit of a hard argument to persuade people about. Tom Wright, for instance, he likes a lot about the book and a lot about my work, but he's not so sure about that as the master narrative as, as an example. <laughs>
just out of curiosity, does he, uh, he does like the idea of story worldview, which is I don't oh, know yeah. if he used that or if other people use that. What, what what is his modification or how does what's his approach? I don't know if I could. I know it have yeah. it probably have Abraham in it. <laughs> he loves yeah, Abraham. exactly. He he wants. I don't think he thinks there's any one text that captures Paul's right. master narrative. That it's it comes out in different ways in different places. But it would definitely want to be more explicit about probably more explicit about creation, about the call of Israel, um, probably even more explicit about new creation, which is why I just said a moment ago, I think there's allusions to Adam. I think there's allusion to new creation with every knee will confess that Jesus is Lord. So I think you get that kind of scriptural narrative, but the focus is clearly, and I think this is why it's Paul's master narrative, not necessarily everybody's master narrative. The focus is clearly on um, the self-giving, self-humbling story of, of descent and then exaltation that provides the basis not only for the cruciform life, but for the hope of resurrection and glorification uh, for the for the church and, and for the world. Uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about um, how the conversation has developed. You've already started talking about this, but um, you know, obviously the book was written a couple decades ago and you've done other things, but in some ways, a lot of your work uh, continues to develop this, this kind of core idea, this core approach to Paul. So you've written on uh, kenosis and theosis. You've written on missional hermeneutics. Um, you've done stuff in John uh, and Revelation and other things. Um, uh, I think, as I recall, you and I talking, uh, you know, back when you you uh, worked on this uh, new edition, that you didn't change the content of the book in this edition. There is new material because you do the afterword with some of the reflection. But if you were, and I think a lot of this is, you know, uh, once you say I'm going to do a revision, then you got to go through and it feels like you have to write a whole new book. I, that, that's my, that's my understanding of how difficult it is to do new editions. So I'm guessing that's comes into play as you're like, well, this was good. I like what I did. Um, but if you were going to change something, if you were going to add a chapter, if you were going to, and it's hard, do you just change, you know, footnotes or what, but if you were going to change something, if you're going to add a chapter, what would you add now, 20 years later? Yeah. This is going to, I don't, I don't want this to sound hubristic or, or proud, but I actually stand by every word in the book. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's nothing that I would change in terms of content. The one thing that I think I would say to be more explicit than what is implicit is that uh, cruciformity is not, um, is not a, uh, a deadly negative, I know that sounds funny, Chris Foreman is not deadly. Uh, it's not a deadly negative lifeless form of existence, but rather just the opposite. And I, and I say this, but it could have been perhaps said more loudly. And the term that I've coined, I, I coined this uh, probably about five years ago now, is to put the adverb, I'm sorry, adjective, resurrectional in front of the word cruciformity that Paul's understanding of cruciformity is that it is infused with the life-giving spirit of Christ, the, the spirit of the resurrection, the reality of the resurrection, so that it's a, it's a paradox of the most profound kind. The cruciformity is actually life-giving, both for the person who practices it or the community that, pra community that practices it, and for those who experience its, its benefits, it, its gift or whatever. Um, so if you will, um, uh, resurrection infused, uh, a cross shaped life. And it, it, I was, I was happy for the, probably the most sustained criticism of the book has been that it, it, it could sound like it's just, um, death and gloom and all of that. Uh, yeah, and and so I, I've tried to address that in in using that in that phrase. That's probably the only significant. Um, uh, I want I want to say change addition I would make to to be more explicit about that. 
Yeah, well, I, you know, just to defend your choices in the book, um, you know, I mean, Paul, you know, talks about carrying around the necrosis, the, you know, the, the death of Christ in his body and things like that. Uh, but at the same time, he does uh, he does talk about the great joy of you know we gave to you our lives you know in First Thessalonians things like that. So um, there are I do I, you do mention in the book there are some other modifications of your phraseology have appeared like Christiformity, which my colleague Scott McKnight really likes, or resurrectiformity. I think you say is a mouthful, which is true. Um, I, I really do like cruciformity because it gets at that heart of that um, sacrificial nature of of Christ's. Uh, own life and then you know what that reflects on for us that's actually a nice segue into kind of my last uh, set of questions here can i Thinking... comment on that real quickly just to yes say, go ahead i don't i don't object to the form to the term christoformity yeah but i do think that cruciform as a general understanding of new testament spirituality or or discipleship or whatever but with respect to paul that's too vague he he's his understanding of conformity is specifically to the crucified messiah so. yeah yeah i mean if, if your christology is cruciform then it makes sense but but cruciformity it gives that to me it gives that punch okay. of of um kind of you know you think of bonhoeffer you know when when christ calls he bids come and die it's that same you know of course you're gonna have resurrection life but this is the calling um, I, should, I know you want to ask a question but speaking of bonhoeffer real quick bonhoeffer was also behind the scenes of this and writing this entire book. I read Bonhoeffer's discipleship book for the first time when I was 17 or 18 years old. So it had a major impact on, on me. And some people have even said this is like, you know, an academic, an academic uh, Pauline study of uh, revisiting Bonhoeffer's cost of discipleship. Yeah, and and that would be a compliment, I think. Sorry to interrupt again. No, yeah. So that actually is a good segue into um, talking about uh, the the book as um, something that you want to see taken seriously in the church today, especially thinking about our contact, which is our context, which is American churches. Yeah. There are many different ways that Paul gets used in churches um, for all kinds of reasons um, across the spectrum of traditions. And my sense is, as I read Cruciformity and reread it now, you have certain hopes for the book in terms of how it will take root uh, in in Christian communities. Um, what does Cruciformity look like in the church? Um, and and what, I guess, you know, knowing that there are going to be pastors and seminary students that watch uh, this interview, uh, what are some dangers in the church of of how the New Testament, how Paul is being used wrongly or, or lived out wrongly? And then what does cruciformity open up for churches in terms of living according to uh, the way of Jesus? Yeah. There's so many ways that Paul is misread and misused. I think I could spend the whole time just responding to that. So I, I think I'll take the more positive, um, what he has to offer, in ter especially in terms of um, concerns within the church broadly, especially in, in the Western context and particularly in the American context. We are a culture, in my view, that's um, intoxicated by power, intoxicated by rights, um, the freedom to do what I want. And this comes out in so many different ways, whether it's the, the you know, the super emphasis on the Second Amendment and, and my right to take guns wherever, any kind of gun I want, anywhere I want, including into the, the shopping mall or into church. I mean, this, this preoccupation with this idol idolatrization, if that's the word, of, of rights. And that's only one example. It happens in lots of other ways. It's ways such as I have, I have the right not to wear a mask. I have the right not to get a vaccine, the very concrete everyday life. That's so, uh, liberty is so, in, in this very libertinist understanding is so much a part of American culture and American churches. Mm -hmm. And the gospel that Paul offers, the gospel of God that he offers, challenges that at, at its core. Uh, that, and it, it, it makes its way into churches in so many different ways. I've, I've been very happy to see, for instance, Tim Gombas write a book about you know, cruciformity and ministry. Uh, I, I've had, over the years since I first wrote Cruciformity, I've had many pastors write to me and say, I believe what you're saying, but in my denominational context, 
it's expected that we get, you know, the older we get, the bigger church we get, the more powerful we get. Mm -hmm. And then you have the incidents, whether it's in a small particular church or a big mega church where people get too much power and they misuse it. And we see all kinds of you know, horrible consequences from that. So that would be one area where I think Paul offers a, a whole way of life to, to what does it mean to be in leadership? What does it mean to be in power? What does it mean simply to be a Christian in the Western American context where we've Id idolized the wrong things, you know? Um, so that would be one major area. Another major area for me would simply be the notion that we, um, as uh, American Christians, tend to be very individualistic. Hmm. And Paul doesn't, he doesn't leave the individual out of the picture, but he is so focused on the community that the community has to embody the gospel, not just in words, but in its whole way of life. And uh, it's not just about me and Jesus. It's about the community embodying this for the sake of the world. So those are two major areas, power and community or community mission, if you will, community, even holiness, which I think is, is so fundamental to Paul and, and to Christian life. Uh, that's that's great, and and I'm glad you mentioned Tim Gomez's book because I actually used that as a textbook in my in the previous course I taught on Philippians oh. and and Philemon, and you know students really resonated with it because um, Tim talks about case studies of of church abuse and abuse of power, and uh, the book is called Power and Weakness, so it's it's really drawing off of what you're talking about, which is. Um, humility, uh, service, um, and kind of upside down kingdom kinds of things. Mm. Um, as we wrap up, I just want to ask you if you could recommend uh, who are, you know, who are the scholars and what are the books that are being written now that you feel like carry on that, um, that, that uh, interest in the same subject, cruciformity. So if, if you were to, you know, you see sometimes a music where it says, if you like this music, you'll also like uh, so what would you say if you like cruciformity, here are two or three other books uh, by other scholars. I know I know students and, and listeners will want to read your other books, uh, but uh, who, who's doing the sim similar kinds of work that has inspired you today? Well, we've already mentioned Tim Gombas's book, and, and I've also been pleased, and I can't necessarily name all the authors or, or the uh, uh, titles at the moment, but there have been three or four books in the last few years, not primarily by scholars, but by scholar pastors who've tried to take cruciformity into the church. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned some of these books in the afterword to, um, to cruciformity. So I, I unfortunately can't put my finger on them in the moment. Maybe if you do program notes or something like that, I could send you a, a few titles. Sure. Uh, so that's been very rewarding to see it, if you will, filter down into the pew via scholar pastors. But I'm also looking forward to a new book by John o, uh, Limbaugh. Lin Limbaugh, is that how you say his last name? Limbaugh. 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 Yeah. Uh, he's got a book coming out on Paul and the Cross, which I haven't seen yet. I'm looking forward to that. Um, there are others who have, I think, moved the conversation forward by um, making cruciformity and, and life in Christ central to their work, including Nijay Gupta. Uh, <laughs> So, you know, if you want to buy a, a good commentary on Colossians, for instance, I highly recommend uh, your own work or, or Philippians, and you're, you're doing great work. So you're, 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 pushing the, uh, you're pushing the cruciform agenda in your own voice, and I, and I appreciate that uh, very much. But I, I think what I found over the years is be, because people resonate with so much of what's in the book that um, it's pretty hard these days not to talk it's pretty hard these days to talk about Paul without talking about some of the same ideas. So I think for me, what's most satisfying is to see a, a book that 20 years ago, I didn't know if anybody would buy it, now seems to be something that people take for granted. And I'm, and I'm fine with that. Great. Well, that, that's a good note to end on. Thank you, Dr. Mike Gorman, for your book, Cruciformity. I really recommend this to everybody out there. Um, people have asked me if I have the first edition, so I get the second one. Uh, my recommendation is, um, have I, I don't know how Urban feels about this, but have someone copy out just the afterword if you already own the first edition. But if you don't, um, definitely pick this book up. I've, I've talked to so many people where they've said, I've heard about the book. 
I've heard people mention it. I've, I've seen it noted in footnotes. So if you don't have the book, absolutely get it now um, from Erdman's. Uh, it, it, you'll be interested in the, the book itself, but then also the afterword, which has uh, Dr. Gorman's reflections on um, how the conversation has continued. Um, thank you for, uh, for doing this uh, new edition just to get it back on people's radars. And uh, you can get that anywhere where you buy books. Um, yeah, that afterward is 25 pages. So it's not, it's not just a few reflections. It's, pretty, it's a pretty serious uh, addition to the book. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, thanks so much. And we'll look forward you to your Romans commentary and some of the other things that you're working on. Thanks. Thank you.